major turning point in Peter's life. So that's the little journey we want to go on. We want to reflect a little on that last part of, of Peter's journey with Jesus. The Sabbath school lesson, not this week that's been, but the, well, that's two weeks ago, I think, the first week of the Sabbath school quarterly, um, looked at a bit of background of, of Peter, his, his original call to Christ and the experiences that he had there. We're going to use that as a foundation and focus on his time uh, around the Passion Week. So let's, let's bow our heads in prayer. We're going we're gonna to just pray, ask the Holy Spirit to guide us as we get into the Word this morning. Let's, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we, we pause in your presence. And we just ask that you would be here to guide us and teach us. We understand many of us some of the experiences that Peter had with Jesus. Many of us resonate with his humanity, with his shortcomings, his weaknesses. Father, I pray that as we consider his, his journey through those last days of Jesus' life, his experience of the cross and the resurrection, that we might be challenged, that we might be encouraged, that we might find hope, the same hope that Peter experienced in his hours of darkness. To that end, I just, I just pray for your blessing. I pray for your guidance. I pray that you would speak to us through your word. I pray now for your spirit to come. Bless this time that we have together, please, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. I'm not sure exactly what it is about Peter, but, but many of us, and many of us with, with different backgrounds, different experiences, different personality types, all resonate to some degree with, with Peter and his journey. And I think that's because Peter in many ways typifies, perhaps, perhaps in some extreme ways, the fallenness of humanity. And, and that fallen humanity trying desperately to follow Christ. Yeah, it's interesting to me that Peter is introduced in the beginning of the Gospels, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19, as Jesus invites him to follow me. And then as the Gospels close, John chapter 21, 19 to 22, that the Gospels close with Jesus inviting Peter to follow me. And so Peter, Peter kind of just encapsulates all that it means to be a follower of Christ. We, we see Peter warts and all because, because Peter's the one that's out there. He's the impetuous one, the impulsive one, the one who speaks what everyone else is probably thinking but doesn't dare to say. Peter is the one who is all or nothing. He's, he's in boots and all. He's the master of the absolute statement. And so we see Peter, he comes across as one who is real, who is raw, who, who we, we look at and think, yeah, there's hope for me. There's hope for me. And as I said, the Sabbath school lesson has covered a lot of that. And, and I want to pick it up really as, as we get near the end. And that is in Luke chapter 22. So if you have your Bibles... Turn with me to Luke chapter 22. And I want to just really touch down in a few key places in the story. And see if we can see in the story of Peter, in the experience of Peter and, and, and the cross and the resurrection of Christ, some, some little glimmers of hope, I guess, that's really what we want to see, something that will encourage us and inspire us. But some, some points of similarity between Peter and us, between his experience and ours. So let's, let's start in Luke chapter 22. And we're going to start off in verse 31, 31 to 34. 
the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Simon, of course, was, was another name that Peter was known by. Simon Peter is, is, is referred when, when the two names are used together. Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. I want to, I want to try and bullet point this so that it's, it's sort of clear as we go through. The first, the first point that stands out to me is that Jesus sees Peter's danger. Jesus sees the danger that Peter is in and he warns him. All right, that's, that's point number one. Jesus sees Peter's danger and he warns him. And I would suggest to you that the same is true for us. Jesus sees the danger that we face and he seeks to warn us. He seeks to warn us. What is the danger? Notice verse 31. Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as weak. Now the, the you here in the Greek is plural. Changes to singular a little bit later on. But here it's plural. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you, plural. You as a group of believers, a group of followers, you are the target of Satan's attack. That's, that's the point that Jesus is making initially here. What does it mean that Satan has asked for you? Well, we can take a couple of things from that. And I... And I automatically think of the story of Job when I, when I read this. Because in the story of Job, Satan comes to Jesus and asks for permission to bring trial and suffering into Job's life. God points out to Satan Job's faithfulness. And of course, Satan challenges God and says he's only faithful because you've blessed him so much. Take away your hand from him and he'll curse you. That's what Satan said, wasn't it? And so Jesus says to Peter, Satan has asked for you. And I don't know if Peter thought about the story of Job. Maybe he did. Maybe Jesus was trying to help Peter see that he was in the firing line just as Job was. But that's essentially what is taking place. These 12, there's probably only 11 left at this point, but they are the, they are the faithful few. They're, they're the ones who have committed themselves to Christ. They have taken the name of Christ. They have identified themselves as his followers. And so Satan has targeted them. That he may sift them. That he may sift them. Are there any parallels for us? as professed followers of Christ, as those who have committed ourselves to him. Could it be possible that Satan has us in his sights? Could it be possible that having, having set out on the journey, having become pilgrims and strangers, as Peter refers to us in his epistle, having, having chosen to give our lives to Christ and identify ourselves with him, that we have become the targets of Satan's attacks? It's true, isn't it? It's true. Satan wants to sift us just as he wanted to sift the disciples. And it's interesting, in the writings of Ellen White, she talks about a sifting time. She talks about a time of, of, of trial that the church will face at the end. And I think there are many parallels between the experience of the disciples here at the time of the cross and the experience of the church at the end. There is a sifting time. There is a time of testing. 
a time of trial coming that will challenge the believers. And Jesus sees it coming. He knows what the disciples are about to face and he warns them. Same is true for us, isn't it? We've been privileged to have warning messages given to us through Scripture, through, through the spirit of prophecy, warning us that we are about to face a time of testing. A time of sifting when trials will come, where God will allow Satan to work his work in the world, to work his work even upon the church, so that, to use the words of Ellen White, sinners will be sifted out of Zion. It'll be a difficult time. It'll be a time of, of, of great suffering, great tribulation. It will be a sifting time. Jesus knows our danger and he warns us. I want to suggest to you that, that there's probably a, 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 a more personal application we should make as well. Because we can look and we should look toward the time that lies before us, the time that will test the church, the time that will test God's people corporately. But every day we face tests and trials, don't we? Every day we face challenges that try our faith. Every day Satan seeks to draw us away from Christ. He seeks to, to, to discourage us bring doubt, disappointment, despair into our experience. Does Jesus see that? Does he know that's coming? He does, doesn't he? And he seeks to warn us. He seeks to warn us. He seeks to warn us corporately of what lies ahead in the future. He seeks to warn us individually of, of, of the individual trials and temptations that we'll face. And I'll come to that in a little bit more. But I want us just to come back to the text Jesus knew Peter's weakness, so he knew the danger and he warned him. He knows our danger and he warns us. The second point I want to make from this, and this comes from verse 32. It starts off plural. Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But in verse 32 it changes. And it's not clear in every English translation, but it changes to the singular. But I have prayed for you. Peter... Peter, I have prayed for you personally. That's, that's how it changes. So Jesus knows the danger that we face and he warns us, but he also knows our weaknesses as individuals. And I find this so encouraging. He knows our weaknesses and he prays for us. Isn't that powerful? I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. I have prayed for you. Now, I, I head off to, to, to church meetings sometimes when I'm doing evangelistic programs, when I'm facing whatever challenge. My, my wife says to me, she says, I'm going to be praying for you. I'm going to be praying for you. And it encourages me. And when church members say, hey, hang in there, pastor, we're praying for you, it's encouraging. But how would it be? How would it be if you were to hear the voice of Jesus saying to you, hang in there, Mark, I am praying for you. I am praying for you. I want to listen to this. This is um, Robert Murray McShane, a great um, preacher from many years ago. D died at a young age from, from burnout. Gave his life in the, in the cause of Christ. He says, I'm often tempted to say, how can this man save us? How can Christ in heaven deliver me from lust which I feel raging in me? The nets I feel enclosing me. This is the father of lies again. Christ is able to save to the uttermost. I ought to study Christ as an intercessor. He prayed most for Peter, who is to be most tempted. And then he says this. This is just so powerful. He says, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet the distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. He ever lives to make intercession for us. That's what it says in the book of Hebrews. Christ is praying for you. He is praying for you. He knows the danger and he seeks to warn you. He knows the weakness that is inherent in you. And he's praying for you. 
He is praying for you. There's a third point, and I want us to go to, I want us to, go to Matthew 26. Matthew chapter 26. Peter, Peter, of course, is, Jesus is trying to warn him, trying to help him see the danger that he's in. And Peter says, look, if everyone else denies you, I won't. Jesus confronts him and says, Peter, you will, you will deny me three times before the cock crows. Jesus knows exactly the danger that Peter is in. He knows his weakness. In Matthew chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. We come to the garden. Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John. He began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he said to them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. I want you to notice verse 40 and 41. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. Who does he address? Peter. He said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, Jesus knew Peter. He knew Peter's zeal. He knew his enthusiasm. He knew his, his, his commitment. His spirit was willing. But Peter was weak. He had a weakness, a weakness that he wasn't even aware of himself. And, and Jesus, as he, as he addresses Peter's weakness, he says two things. One, Peter, I am praying for you. Peter, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you'll be strengthened. I'm praying that you will be able to endure the trial. But it doesn't end there. Jesus challenges Peter and says, Peter, you need to be praying for yourself. You need to be praying for yourself. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Satan is after you. Satan has you in his sights. And yes, I am praying for you, but you too must pray. You too must pray. Desire of Ages, page 713. We read it was in sleeping when Jesus bade him watch and pray that Peter had prepared the way for his great sin. All the disciples, by sleeping in that critical hour, sustained a great loss. Christ knew the fiery ordeal through which they would have passed. He knew how Satan would work to paralyze their senses, that they might be unready for the trial. Therefore, it was that he gave them warning. Had those hours in the garden been spent in watching and prayer, Peter would not have been left to depend upon his own feeble strength. He would not have denied his Lord. Powerful statement, isn't it? Jesus was praying for Peter that his faith might not fail, but Peter failed to pray for himself. Peter failed to avail himself of the strength that might have been his if he had committed himself to prayer in the garden. And I wonder sometimes, when I look at my own experience, I wonder sometimes if I had been faithful, if I had been more diligent to spend that time in prayer in the morning, if I wouldn't have fallen when I encountered the trials during the day. You know, there are times when, when I wake up early, I wake up and it's, it's maybe it's four o'clock or it's whatever. I look at, my, look at my digital alarm clock next to my bed and it's shining there in the dark and I think that's ridiculous. Why am I awake so early? I don't need to get up now. I've, I need to sleep. I'm tired. And yet I feel this impression to get up and, and, and go to my study and, and get out my Bible and read and pray. 
And there are times when, when, I, when I heed the call, I sense God calling me and I get up and I drag myself out of bed and I take time and I pray and I appreciate the time that I spend there with the Lord. There are other times when I, when I roll over and I try to go back to sleep. I roll over and I try to go back to sleep and I neglect time in prayer. I neglect time in prayer and it is always to my detriment. And you would think that I would have learnt by now, wouldn't you? Sometimes you're just tired. Sometimes you're just absolutely exhausted. And you just think to yourself, you know, I don't know what today's going to hold. It doesn't look that bad. My diary doesn't seem that full. Like it, can't, it, can't, it can't be a bad day today. You know? God will have to get me through. It's presumptuous, isn't it? It's presumptuous thinking. It's presumptuous thinking. The book Steps to Christ, page 94, Ellen White says, The darkness of the evil one encloses those who neglect to pray. The whispered temptations of the enemy entice them to sin. And it is all because they do not make use of the privileges that God has given them in the divine appointment of prayer. Jesus knows our danger and he seeks to warn us. He knows our weaknesses and he prays for us. He knows our weaknesses and he also exhorts us to watch and to pray. How did Peter go? Peter didn't watch and pray, did he? Peter was sleeping when he should have been praying and you know how the story unfolds. Let's, let's go back to Luke, Luke chapter 22 again. And we're looking at verses 54 down to 62. Having arrested Jesus, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are of them. Peter said, Man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. You know, I remember talking to some, some missionaries who'd come back from Romania. It was a few years ago when I was in New Zealand and uh, the, the country had just opened up to, to, to Christians going in there after the communists had kept it pretty closed for a long time. And, and this, this couple from New Zealand had spent a couple of years over there working with the, working with the Christians. And they made an interesting statement. They said, you know, they, they have lived for so long under the communist regime. They, they've uh, been oppressed. They haven't been able to exercise their faith. They haven't been able to live as Christians. Many of them have, have, have suffered in, in horrific ways. They've, they've lost loved ones. People have died for their faith in that country. And, and, and they said this. They said they know how to die for Christ, but they don't know how to live for him. They know how to die for Christ, but they don't know how to live for him. And I thought that was a profound statement. 
And I've reflected on that since then. Because it's a different thing, isn't it? Peter, Peter was willing to lay down his life for Christ. When he said, I, I will go with you to prison and to death, he meant every word of it. Alan White says that. When, when they came to arrest Jesus, where was Peter? He had his sword out, ready to hack into those guys one at a time. And he would have fought until, until they had taken his life. If it wasn't for the fact that Jesus told him to put his sword away. Peter would have fought and died there in the garden. But when it came to standing up for Christ, when the pressure was on, when it came to identifying with Christ amongst a crowd of people who, who weren't on his side, who would have probably ridiculed him, who would have questioned his faith, maybe even questioned his sanity. Peter wasn't able to stand, was he? He wasn't able to stand. Like the Romanian Christians, he knew how to die for Christ, but he didn't know how to live for him. It's a challenge, isn't it? It's a challenge. To live for Christ in the workplace. To live for Christ in our homes. You know, we, we understand the conflict that lies before us. We've talked about the sifting time. We, we, we study as Adventists about the mark of the beast and the great tests to our faith that will come in the future. We, we understand about the Sabbath and what that represents and what that will mean when, when, when everything comes to a head. And, and many of us, perhaps all of us if need be, would take our stand for the Sabbath. We would lay down our lives if it meant choosing between the Sabbath and a false day of worship. We would die for the truth. And yet when it comes to our families, when it comes to our, our spouses, when it comes to the workplace and, and, and the challenge to stand up for Christ in the little areas of our lives, we struggle, don't we? We struggle to be consistent. We struggle to maintain a calm and Christ-like spirit when, when, when we're riled up. We struggle to be fair and just in our dealings. We, we, we struggle to respond with love when someone speaks harshly or unkindly to us. And we deny our Lord in so many small ways. So many small ways. And here's Peter. Here's Peter, the great preeminent disciple of Christ, burly fisherman, impetuous, impulsive, self confident. The one who would stand with his Lord, though all others forsook him. Here he is denying Christ. Jesus sees our danger and he warns us. He knows our weakness and he prays for us. And he also sees us fall. In spite of his prayers on our behalf, in spite of the warnings that he gives to us, we fall, don't we? He sees us fall. Verse 61, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. What kind of look was that? Desire of Ages, page 712. While the degrading oaths were fresh upon Peter's lips and the shrill crowing of the cock was still ringing in his ears, the Saviour turned from the frowning judges and looked full upon this poor disciple. At the same time, Peter's eyes were drawn to his master. In that gentle countenance he read deep pity and sorrow, but there was no anger there. The sight of that pale, suffering face, those quivering lips, that look of compassion and forgiveness pierced his heart like an arrow. And it says in verse 62, Peter went out and wept bitterly. 
Peter had let himself down, hadn't he? He had let his Lord down. He had failed. He had failed at the point where he was so confident that he would stand. Jesus sees us fall. He sees us fall. And I would suggest to you that the look that he gives us is the same look of pity and sorrow, the look of compassion and forgiveness. In the little book, Steps to Christ, there's this great paragraph which I return to, unfortunately, too often. It says this, Steps to Christ, page 64, it says, There are those who have known the pardoning love of Christ and who really desire to be children of God. Yet they realize that their character is imperfect, their life faulty. And they are ready to doubt whether their hearts have been renewed by the Holy Spirit. Have you had those thoughts? Have you had those experiences? Well, you wonder, is it even worth bothering anymore? Why don't, why don't I just quit now and, and save everybody a lot of trouble? Save Jesus all those prayers that don't seem to do much. To such, I would say, do not draw back in despair. We shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes. But we are not to be discouraged. Even if we're overcome by the enemy, we're not cast off, not forsaken and rejected of God. No, Christ is at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Said the beloved John, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And do not forget the words of Christ himself, the Father himself loveth you. He desires to restore you to himself, to see his own purity and holiness reflected in you. And if you will but yield yourself to him, he that hath begun a good work in you will carry it forward to the day of Jesus Christ. Pray more fervently, believe more fully. As we come to distrust our own power, let us trust the power of our Redeemer. And we shall praise him who is the health of our countenance. Jesus sees us when we fall. And he looks upon us with compassion and forgiveness. He looks upon us with compassion and forgiveness. Turn with me to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Time is, time is gone. Let's see if we can pull it together. Peter went out and whipped bitterly. And I, and I imagine those next 24, 48, 72 hours would have been seemed like an eternity for Peter. His master, the, the, the man he loved, had been crucified. Peter had been powerless to intervene, powerless to do anything to, to, to deliver him. Not only that, Peter had, had denied him, denied him in his hearing. Mark chapter 16, after that long Sabbath, Sabbath when I'm sure Peter didn't experience the blessing of Sabbath rest, he wouldn't have experienced much peace in his soul. But on the morning of the first day, the morning of the first day, the woman came to the tomb found that the stone had been rolled away, verse 4 and verse 5. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You see Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Verse 7, but go tell his disciples. And, and, and Mark adds this. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. Why does Mark add, and Peter? 
a couple of things. One is that Mark wasn't one of the disciples. Mark was Peter's traveling companion. He was Peter's assistant. He got his information from Peter. Mark's account of Jesus' life and ministry is essentially what Peter gave to him. And so he tells it to a large degree from Peter's perspective. And he includes this little note that the others leave out. The, the angels say to the woman, go and tell his disciples that Jesus is risen. And don't forget to tell Peter. Peter must know. Peter needs to hear that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Don't forget to tell Peter. Don't forget to tell Peter. Peter has been in the depths of despair. Peter has been as low as a man can go. His heart is broken. His, his, his whole being is pained by his failure and his mistake. Jesus knows his despair. He knows the despair. He knows the heartache and he offers hope. He offers hope. And it's the same for us, isn't it? He sees us fall. He looks upon us with compassion and forgiveness. And then when we're, when we're down in that, in that pit of despair and, and we're beating ourselves up and, 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 and condemning ourselves for the things that we've done, Jesus sees our despair, he sees our discouragement, he sees the disappointment that we have in ourselves and he extends to us hope. Hope based on the fact that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And it's interesting to me, and, 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 and I don't know exactly how, how Peter understood it all, but in, in 1 Peter 1 and verse 3, as Peter begins his epistle, he says, yeah, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has begotten us again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And I can't help but wondering if that was Peter's experience. Born again to a living hope on the basis of the fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. It was, it was, it was our sin that killed him. It was, it, was, it was Peter's sin, your sin, my sin our failures, our mistakes that condemned Christ to the cross and to the grave. But the good news on resurrection morning was that, that, that sin, the grave, Satan couldn't hold him there. God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead. Your sin, my sin, could not hold him in the grave. Christ triumphed over sin and death. And because of that, there's hope. There's hope for sinners like you and I. There's hope for sinners like you and I. Jesus knows our despair. He offers us hope. He points to his victory. He points to his victory on the cross, his victory over sin and death when he rose from the grave. And he says to you and I, in our discouragement, in our despair, he says, there is hope for you. There is hope for you in Jesus. There is hope for you in Jesus. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how far you've fallen. It doesn't matter how discouraged and full of despair you might find yourself to be. There is hope for you today. There is hope for you today in the victory of Jesus. One last thought. Turn with me to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Jesus sees our danger and he warns us. He knows our weakness and he prays for us. He sees us fall. He looks upon us with compassion and forgiveness. He knows the depths of our despair. He offers us hope and encouragement. John 21. John 21. He sees our repentance and he provides restoration. Notice what happens here in John 21. Jesus is meeting with his disciples 
They've been fishing. Jesus has appeared to them after his resurrection. They've been eating breakfast by the lake. And it says in, in John 21 verse 15, When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? It's a pretty tough question to ask, isn't it? What had Peter boasted? Though all the others forsake you, I will not. Jesus, you can count on me. If they desert you, I will stay faithful. I will stay strong. My loyalty to you is greater than the other disciples. And Jesus confronts Peter. And he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you really still believe that you love me more than all these other disciples do? Do you have the same self-confidence, the same self-assuredness that you had before? Is your confidence still in yourself? And how does Peter answer? He's not as boastful anymore, is he? He's not as proud. He said to him, Lord, you know that I love you. Lord, you know. You know my heart. And he said to him, feed my lambs. Verse 16, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Three times Peter denied his Lord. Three times Jesus asks him the question, Peter, do you love me? Amen. Jesus still had a work for Peter to do. Jesus still had a work for Peter to do. Peter, who had let him down, who had failed in the moment of testing, was still able to be used in the work of the gospel. Jesus reinstates him. Most assuredly, I say to you, verse 18, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you were, when you were old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. We all make mistakes, don't we? God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. God created us with, with gifts and abilities, with talents, with, with, with a unique set of, of, of abilities so that he could use us in his work. We mess up, don't we? We mess up. You know, I think of Moses. Moses, who was, who was chosen by God at a young age, given privileges, given special training. And at age 40, he goes out and he, he knows that God has a plan for his life. He, Moses is, is, is self-confident, self-sufficient. And he sees an Egyptian beating up one of the slaves and he kills the Egyptian, buries him in the sand. And he gets found out. And the New Testament tells us that Moses couldn't understand why the, why the Hebrews didn't all rally behind him and, and recognize him as the deliverer. It wasn't God's timing. It wasn't God's plan. Moses had messed up. Moses had thought that, that he could do the job in his own strength and he messed it up. And he had to spend 40 years in the wilderness tending sheep to get him to the place where God could finally use him. Peter was the same, wasn't he? And I would suggest to you that you and I are not that different. God's called each one of us. He's given us gifts, abilities, talents. He's given us the opportunity to make a unique contribution in his work. 
We fail. We let him down. And yet he calls us again. He longs to restore us. He longs to re-establish us in the work. To take, to take us in our weakness and our fallenness and to use us to his honour and glory. At Pentecost, you see, as the Spirit is poured out, Peter stands up and preaches a powerful sermon. 3,000 people are converted. Jesus sees the danger and he seeks to warn us. Are we listening? He knows our weakness and he's praying for us. And he encourages us, exhorts us to pray for ourselves. He sees us when we fall. He looks upon us with compassion and forgiveness. He knows the depths of our despair and discouragement. He offers us hope through his victory on the cross, and his resurrection from the dead. He sees our contrition and our repentance and he provides restoration, gives us purpose, gives us a task to do. Will we accept it? Will we do what he's called us to do? That's the only question that we have answer isn't it let's stand and sing our closing hymn we're going to sing beneath the cross of jesus i fain would take my stand let's uh let's sing this together in closing 303 Father, as we at this Easter season turn our thoughts perhaps a little more than usual to the cross, to the, the death and resurrection of Christ, we thank you for all that it means to us. Thank you for, thank you for the, the story of Peter. Thank you for the experience that was recorded there for us. 
Lord, we see ourselves in the story in so many ways. We're grateful for your willingness to suffer along with us in our weakness, in our humanity. We thank you for causing us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that it's not going to fade away, reserved in heaven for us. Father, you've set our feet upon the path. You've called us to follow Jesus. I pray that like Peter, though we may stumble and fall at times, that you'd continue to reach out to us, to set us back on our feet again, that we might meet at last in your kingdom in that place of eternal inheritance. We ask, please, for Jesus' sake.